people here have, have sold millions and have been responsible for cultural advancements in the music industry, huge leaps. Many of the, the, the records that they've been involved with basically are like part of the soundtrack of our lives. Many of the things that they've been involved, huge things like who we be, etc., have been formed by people that are on this panel. Yeah. So this I'm just taking it that you know what, there's a level of understanding in the audience that is already there. Because we're gonna jump in. It's how it is. Okay. All right. So literally I'm gonna kick in. This panel is called Major Mindset. As you know, at Creating Vision, we go into big arguments about the titles of panels. And Major Mindset, the whole thing about it, it's this thing that goes, okay, there's a lot of talk, obviously, indie, there's lots to talk about, DSPs, there's lots to talk about. But the thing here is, Major Label Acts, it's this thing that's exploring that, uh, not just major label acts, but major label, major corporate executives. It's the mindset that goes with it. Because there, there could be many a person watching this that goes, okay, maybe this is something that I'm looking at. So here we go. First question, what characteristics to you makes an artist a major a label act in 2020 who wants to take this question first because i'm going to come for one of you okay go for it Ines. i'll start um just my opinion but um i'd probably say uh somebody that's got an incredible work drive and ethic has global ambition um a business mentality a real clarity of vision about where they want to go um, and the want for some high investment, somebody that's that's willing to really work their socks off in order to be successful. And when you say a business mentality, what do you mean? Let me just pluck one thing out of there. No, it's fine. I think I think a business mentality in the, in the terms of that they know that they're that that they are a business and they they are a captain of their ship. They know what they want to say. They they kind of know what they want to look like, um, and they're prepared to do whatever it takes to get there. For instance, is one of those artists an artist that comes whole? Do they just come fully formed or are they just uh, or are they aware that they need a team around it? I think it, 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 it could be either or, but I think just in, in my opinion, I think some people are kind of, they're kind of born with a bit of a star quality. They kind of come, maybe they were born, to, you know, born to do it. They live and breathe music. They've been doing it since a child and their only this is their only way of life born to do it is the perfect segue to arnie and diwali of course so let's look at it some artists that you know as having a major mindset why do you think they have it how does that mindset reveal itself i think it's a really good question um i think some artists either have it or they don't have it um i actually remember uh, a story from many years ago quite early on in my sort of career in music um, my business partner Kirsty um, her much younger sister went to the Brit school and her mum had gone to this kind of showcase event and she called us the next day and she was like I was walking down the corridor and I heard this girl kind of like warming up her vocal and she just completely blew me away. And it wasn't necessarily about her being on the stage performing. It was just hearing her warm up the vocal in the corridor that kind of drew drew her in. Mm -hmm. And she said that she thought this girl would be a star. And she gave her mine and Kirsty's number. And this girl came in and uh, with her mum and her guitar and like played a few songs for us. Um, and the girl was Adele. She came in and she she played Daydreamer. And it just completely blew us away. And whilst I'm still really gutted that I didn't put a management contract in front of her, hey! um, it was still one of those moments where I guess I just knew 
in that very moment that this girl had a major mindset and obviously the success that she's enjoyed since kind of speaks for itself. Okay. Um, Jane has asked, why didn't you sign up? <laughs> Sorry. I just... it's, it's interesting. I think at, at, at that time it was, um, it was very early on in my career and, and around that time, like the company that I run now is, is very sort of diversified. There's, there's many different facets to it, but at that moment in my career, I was really yeah, focusing enough. on the uh, role as, as a booking agent, first and foremost, booking kind of DJs into shows like hosting showcase events in London. And I remember the meeting finished and Kirsty and I kind of like looked at each other. We were like, fuck, this girl is part of my French. Um, this girl is incredible. Like we, we, sh we need to do something with her. And we were kind of sat there in, in our little kind of serviced office in Leicester square. And I like Googled um, or whatever the equivalent would have been all, all those years ago. Um, music management contract. Yeah. So I was like sat there talking to Kirsty. We were like, maybe we just need to kind of sign her. Like we've not done management before. We've done bookings up to this point. And I don't know, but part of, part of me always feels like you have to be bringing some additional level to an artist's career if you're going to participate in their income. Right. And so I, I kind of maybe took the slightly weaker approach of thinking to myself, we're not quite ready for management, but maybe we'll help her with, with a show. So we actually booked her for uh, her first show, which was like a showcase in this tiny little dingy club in uh, Maid Street in, in Soho. Um, and it was there that she ended up signing her, well, meeting the people to sign both her records and her publishing deal. And she met Jonathan Dickens and, and obviously he's got 20% and we earned zero. But hey-ho, uh, what doesn't break you makes you stronger, right? And what is for you will not pass you by. True. Right? Yeah. So, so yeah. Okay. So I'm going to come to um, Austin now. I'm going to say, name some artists that you know as just having major mindset. Just name a few that you, for you, have just seemed to have it. Everyone that signed to Atlantic record <laughs> every single one. Um, you know what time it is. Um, yeah, man. I think for me, um, first of all, big up everyone on the panel. Um, I just think, yeah, it's the same sort of characteristics that have been, you know, mentioned before. Um, you know, you want someone who very early on blows you away with the way they behave, the way that they appear. Um, and there's a real consistency in all of those behavioural traits with the artists that do end up being major. So, you know, you can look at someone like Ed Sheeran, who's the most extreme example of that, obviously, when it comes to Atlantic Records. You can look at Jess Glynn, you can look at Anne-Marie, and then you can look at the ones that are the next generation of stars that are coming through, someone like Tion Wayne, someone like Darko, Stork Ashley, you know, new artists that are on the roster. Um, the things that I, I notice is, you know, the way that they behave around production staff when they're on their come up, how they treat the receptionists and the producers that are helping them on their shows. How do they? They treat them well. Yeah. Uh, they treat them well. Yeah. It's them being obsessed with audio perfection. It's them being obsessed with understanding their audience. Um, yeah. And they want that consistency of success, whether that be in live, whether that be chart performance, radio performance, streaming performance. I think there's just always a real consistency in behavior there. And everyone that I've seen, whether it be during my radio and streaming days with, you know, non-Warner acts, right the way through to the acts that we're working with at the moment, man, I think I definitely just see that same behavior. And Shani, do you have some artists that you know as having a major mindset? And why do you think they have it? How does that mindset reveal itself? Um, I agree with Austin. Every artist, uh, not just on Atlantic, but in the Warner Music Group and signed to Warner Chapel. So, but just to continue what he's saying, I think in my experience, and I've been on the label side and on the publishing side, a major mindset artist to me is an artist that is, I've always noticed, artists that are, they are, um, they're not afraid to like go against the grain. Like when Andy is talking about someone like an Adele, 
I remember working with Justin Bieber, his first couple of albums, it was, it was similar to Adele in that perhaps at that time, Adele wasn't the standard of an artist. I remember going to see her early on, that was not the standard. We can, we can all say, well, why didn't you sign Adele? There were a lot of people that would have passed on Adele. There were a lot of people that passed on Justin Bieber. Mm. I signed Travis Scott. And at the time, a lot of people told me I was crazy. Artists that are major never feel major in the beginning. Drake didn't feel major in the beginning. Outkast didn't feel major in the beginning. So I think the major artists never feel that way when they're in front of you. And also the other thing I would add to Austin's point about how they treat people, they are, it's not like just what you see on Instagram. The ones who are major treat it like a job. They don't just, you know, want to party. They don't want to just hang out at the club. They understand that this shit is a job, but that this is their career and they take it seriously. They come to the studio to work. They come to the label to get shit done and they show up and understand that this is their job. This is not just some time to hang out with their boys and have some fun and get girls or guys and shop and go to Dubai. I hear that's where all the rappers in London go. <laughs> <laughs> I just found out, I just found out right before, but like they, they treat it like a job and they're wise and smart about the shit that they do, just like how we are all wise and smart about the shit that we do to progress in our job. So yeah. that's my opinion. It's, it's never easy in the beginning, but you keep going and it's, it's a job. So. Okay. Um, to Sorry. add to that as well, I just wanted to say, I think it's, it's really easy to, to see an artist and kind of recognize that they're talented or they have star power. But I think, it's a, I think what's for me, a major mindset is when you meet with an artist and they have a full-fledged understanding of who they are and they have mm. a very clear vision of where they want to go. So they're not coming into a room going, I know I can sing, but I'll sing whatever you give me. It's more sort of like, this is who I am. This is where I see myself fit. And this is where I want to go to. Um, those are the people that like get me really excited, like people mm -hmm. who know exactly who they are. They know what kind of creative works for them. They know the kind of people they want to speak to. I think that's really important. 100%. I remember like one of the things, I, I, I was lucky enough to find Travis. I think at the time he might've had a really small amount of Instagram followers. And I think on his first video, he it's not out now, but maybe had under a thousand views on YouTube. And every, I won't name names. I'm gonna protect the guilty. But a <laughs> lot of people told me I was absolutely tripping. Like, they were like, yo, it's, what are you doing? Like he, but he didn't give a shit that he made people uncomfortable. He didn't care that people thought he was this or too much like this or too much like that. He never changed who he was. And it's the same thing with any other artist that I worked with early on or that I met early on. They were disruptive and they were who they were and they didn't give a fuck, excuse me. We Go ahead. They didn't, they didn't care about who they were. They were just like, this is who I am. And this is, they didn't change their artistry or their perspective. I'm not saying that as an artist, you shouldn't take advice on board, but your perspective, your artistry is much different than taking advice about how you travel through your career. Travis, you know, Travis took advice, but he didn't change his artistry and his, um, his, his uh, I don't know what you call it, your, that thing, he didn't change that. Got it, got it. Just to talk to that point as well, I'd say that like a few, few years ago, I had this opportunity to work with Craig David and he had obviously been completely out of the public eye for the best part of 15 years. Yep. And I think he is an artist that is has always stayed very true to himself. And it could have been very easy post the career that he had kind of back in like 98 through to kind of 2000, 2001. Could have been very easy for him to have left all that behind, moved over to Miami like he did and got really disillusioned with the whole of the industry. And instead what he did when there was this moment back in 2015 to, I guess, have an inverted commas like comeback moment 
he still stayed very true to himself. But what he did do is he listened to all of those people around him, people that had signed him and given him this opportunity to release music again for a second time. He listened to them uh, and he took their advice on board, but he still challenged us every single day. He would never be somebody that would be told, you have to do it this way. He, he would understand if somebody came into the room and said, this is the reason why you need to do it. But most importantly, you still need to stay true to, to yourself and true to your artistry. And I think actually that's another real sort of quality of, uh, of, a, of a major mindset artist is just that having that sort of authenticity and listening to people around you, but, but never changing your yeah. vision for what you see yourself to be as an artist. It's always, it's always funny that story it's when you think about it they always have that story of it was never supposed to work but like it nobody would have thought but that wasn't supposed to happen but, but whenever you think yeah. of any artist like drake was the kid in the wheelchair remember but you know at the time with justin bieber kids don't work but you know it's always that travis mm -hmm. sounded like kanye but you know, we can go back, you know, it's a whole bunch of things, but every huge artist, Ed Sharon had, I don't know, red hair and looked like this. I don't know if you're allowed but, to say it. I'm sorry. But, you know, like there was a whole bunch of things that whenever it's a huge artist, I love Ed Sharon. Let me go on record. I'm Warner through and through and he's great. But I'm just saying like, there's always a bunch of things around every huge artist that you're always going that there was a whole bunch of reasons why I wasn't supposed to work. And everyone thought that'll never happen. Are you crazy? It's always the way. Rich Castillo, come on in, sir. Tell me about it. Name some major artists that you know and you've probably worked with that have what we call major mindset. Wow. Um, I think what everyone else has said so far is speaks bang on to it. But from my side, the um, thing that I've been close to that I've had major mindsets. I mean, obviously, we're currently working with a kid called Tion Wayne, and the sort of the conversation we're having at the moment, or f for me, feel like somebody with a real sort of international ambition and has a relentless pursuit for greatness and are willing and are willing to sort of put the work in whilst being teetering around the edge of <laughs> dangerous, so to speak, given the recent sort of online activity with him. But um, he's someone I believe has major mentality. Um, We've got um, other artists in the past that we've worked with at other labels. Like I used to work with Steph London, who I would say has, has a major mentality. Um, obviously, I used to live, with, I used to work in Canada as well for quite a while, and we sort of we were quite close to the Shawn Mendes project at the time. And he's someone who we saw whose work rate and ability to deliver audio and his sort of focus was just incredible. So there are just a few names that I, I believe have major mentality and have a major mindset. It's always. It Sorry, Kwame. I was just going to say, just to add to everyone, which I agree with, they, I think f for me personally as well, there also seems to be a thirst for knowledge. They want to understand, they ask questions and they, they do always challenge people with major mindsets, but really quite business savvy in terms of like getting an understanding of, of, of what they need to do or what they should do and listening to, to the people that advise them and asking yeah. why a lot. Yeah, yeah. I like the question, the why thing is very good because yeah. it, it also forces you to ask the question with them as well. And it forces you to sort of grow with them and learn with them. And I think the, the inquisitive sort of artists that are really sort of ambitious and really want to push the boundaries or always want reasoning in everything they're doing and purpose behind every step they take. So sometimes you go hand in hand with them and you sort of go on the journey with them. And it's, it's actually incre an incredible learning if you're sort of around people with that sort of mindset for yourself as an executive. So the next question is, is it nature versus nurture? So when I say that, I mean, what do you see as being the major difference between a major indie act and a major label artist? So we have this thing, obviously, Adele starts off on XL, but then obviously becomes, you know, so she starts off in indie world and then becomes this, you know? It's this thing of, is it something that's just there or is it something that they learn along the way? Can I jump in? I, I, sort, of, I sort of knew you were going to sort of ask that. And I, I really believe it's nature nurtured. Ooh. I think 
Okay. I think I think it's I think it's someone with a natural ability that is allowed to excel in what they do properly by having the tools around them to achieve where they should go to. And and them understanding that as well. And them and, understanding that within a, within them, a support and, system, which is where the major thing comes into place. Because I think once you sort of develop in an independent way, you have the freedom to do whatever you want on on the growth sort of path. But when you get to a point where you have global ambition and you want to be in every territory and and really connect with the world wholly, I think that's where you 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 really can't avoid the major setup. I do agree. And one thing I just wanted to say as well, um, I kind of wear two hats. So I run a management company, uh, which is obviously very independent, uh, but I also run a frontline record label within Sony. So I kind of see it from both sides. And I think the thing that I wanted to make clear so far as I see it, and in my opinion, is that um, you don't have to be signed to a major label to be a major artist. And there's many examples of artists that have gone on and had global success without being signed to a major label. Um, I was listening to one of the panels earlier on and I think somebody sort of chipped in and said AJ Tracy, for example, is like mm. a good example of somebody that has uh, stayed out of the major system of late. Um, but I remember kind of back early on in my career, I worked with a DJ producer called DJ Fresh and I didn't have any experience at that point of um of necessarily kind of managing artists in a uh, electronic space. And he ended up doing a deal uh, with Ministry of Sound, which at that point was uh, an independent dance label. And he went on to sell over 4 million records globally and has had a, a hugely successful career, um, but was never signed to a major record company. So I do think that it's worth sort of young executives and young artists bearing in mind that there are kind of different routes you can go down and still have global success for your artists. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Um, again, nature versus nurture. This whole, I like, by the way, this nature nurtured. I have to uh, ring the bell. For you can have that. You can have that. I have to because that's that's very very uh, a very good way of putting it. That that quite stumped me there. So is the scale of what do you see as a, right? Okay, I'm going to move on now to exec at exec level because obviously here we've got we've got Shani head of international A and R. We've got Austin executive vice president Atlantic Records. We've got Innes MD. We've got Rich A and R di director Atlantic Nemat. We've got senior marketing manager, right? There is also a change that takes place. Andy Viley, founder and CEO of Insanity. So there is also a change that takes place internally when an executive moves from being the new exec on the block to becoming the international executive at boardroom level, right? Manger Mindset explores the changes that take place when pursuing your career goal globally now many people watching right now it's this thing of and as i said we've got three layers we're very very aware that we've got three layers we've got people at entry level that are looking and probably looking they you know one or two stages probably away from even dreaming of it and then we've got people that you know what they're they're here and they're kind of going okay yeah i want to i want to hear because maybe there's something that there's a key here that I need to unlock, okay? What character traits do you see in major mindset people? Name some traits that you have seen repeat themselves in major mindset winners. I'm going to start with Austin. Hey, for Austin. Um, so, for me, it's interesting because you was talking about like the change that, that occurs and um, I've always tried to stay exactly how I've always been in the way that I've kind of moved and operated. And of course, when you get a little bit older and you've got more responsibilities, maybe you've got people reporting into you, you can't necessarily be, you know, the cheeky 20 something year old that you once was. But um, the three things that I would say is um, major mindset people do the basics consistently well. They turn up on time to meetings wherever possible. 
they sign off emails with regards and thank yous. The most smallest things are done consistently well, day in, day out, week in, week out, year after year. And that's the number one thing that I would say. The second thing is that major mindset people think big. Um, <clears throat> if I look at some of the points that were made earlier, um, especially the point about how you know artists like Travis and Drake, it wasn't supposed to happen. All of us on this panel, including this panel itself, was never supposed to happen. There was always a yeah, but what moment when an idea has been put on the table. And if I think about some of the things that I'm really proud of, they were laughed at at first when I first suggested them in meetings and boardrooms and stuff. So they always think big. Um, and then secondly, they take risks. Um, you know, if I look at an example for myself, when I moved from the BBC to Spotify, people didn't get it at first. This wasn't the Spotify of now, where everyone thinks that Spotify is an amazing, big global place to work. Spotify was the new kid on the block at that point. And, you know, I took the risk at that point and it turned out to be an amazing decision for me and my career. So again, I think they're the three things for me, doing the basics consistently well. I can't stress how important that is for anyone who's at junior or middle management level now who's looking to take the step up second one is thinking big and the third one is taking risks interesting have you got an example just to have you got an example of a time when you thought big but those around you didn't yeah, where do you want to start? <laughs> you know what I think. You know what I think. A, I think a really good example is. Uh, let me just think of a recent example. So, okay, if you look, when I was at Spotify and big up Spotify, Spotify are an amazing company. I've got so many friends that that, that are still there now. Um, when we first launched um, a black music brand called Who We Be, which was like a, a playlist brand, um, we wanted to do a live event. And we wanted to really bring that to life and, you know, turn it from just a list of songs in a playlist into a living, breathing brand. And um, we suggested, and it, well, I can't take all the credit for it, it was me and the team that I was working with, you know, we suggested um, doing it at an arena. And it was like, you can't go from a brand that's just launched three months ago to selling out an arena, you know, sort of eight, nine, 10,000 tickets. Why don't we start off with maybe like a club show, two, 300 tickets, and then try and build out from there. But we were determined that if we were able to build this brand up via the playlist, if we were able to um, have a really strong marketing campaign and turn it into the destination for black music fans that were on Spotify, then they'll buy the tickets. And, you know, we launched um, we launched Who We Be um, in the, the December, sorry, the November of 2016. Yeah. And nine months later, we sold that Alexandra Palace. So mm -hmm. I think that's a really good example of taking a risk that maybe some people at the time didn't believe in like i said a lot of people did um but yeah that's one example i'd give mm, okay okay so here we go character traits thank you again austin there so character traits do you see in major mindset name some character traits that you have seen nomad let's go for it um I think speaking from my experience in the in the business, um, working at Sony, I feel like we, Andy, me and you need to represent for Sony, all these Warner lot and like monopolizing this, we're not having it. Um, I think one of the things you need to kind of is, is be very clear and understand what it is that makes you unique and what you bring to the table. Um, working in marketing, I think one of the things that is really, really important is to be able to think ahead, like six months ahead, a year ahead you're working on stuff for the moment but i've already got a plan that i know in six months this is where we're going in a year this is where we're going and having a bit of a hustler mentality as well like not taking no for an answer and, and being able to make things happen even when people tell you no i think that's when it comes to marketing that's really important because some, you know, if you have, you're like you're like Austin said, if you think big, a lot of the time people are going to say no, or people are going to say that's not possible. Especially when if you're within a major label, um, you know, uh, structure, because there's a lot of red tape, there's a lot of you know sign-offs that needs to happen. But just having that hustler mentality of figuring out a way of making things happen, um, even when uh, you know everyone else has said this isn't going to be possible. Is, is important, but I think most of it is that making yourself really unique to the company and offering something different to all of your colleagues um, is, I think is something that's always got me quite far. Okay. I, I think that's a really good point. I think it's uh, 
that most people with a major mindset have the ability to adapt. You, you don't really ever take no. You're a hustler. You find a way around and you think outside the box. And I think that's quite a common trait. And again, I'll just say this I've, I have seen for myself, this thing of, okay, you're cle- you've gone into the meeting knowing that you're going to get a no. And during, as the person speaking to you, they start by saying, well, the and basically from there on, all you see is this. <laughs> In your head, you're just going, how am I going to get around this person to my goal? Right. Okay. Just, to, just to add to that as well, I think um, reading the room, which is what you're saying, is being able to read rooms. I think one thing that I think major mindset people are very good at reading the room and knowing which where to sort of find the touch point to get the conversation moved along. Um, I also think they're not easily offended. I think there's a sort of thick skin, I think, that a lot of major mindset people have. I think they're, they're very good at that. And I also think um, they approach awkward or difficult situations dead on and just get it done. In my opinion, one thing I've seen is if there's all of the presidents, all the majors, they're, they're dealing with real sort of issues daily and even hourly sort of thing. And I think one, one thing consistent about all of them is that they, they deal with it dead on. Sorry, I'm writing some of those down. I think, yeah, I definitely agree with Rich. I think that not being easily offended is sort of you've got to put your ego aside sometimes you might not have the best idea in the room and that's okay <laughs> sometimes you know you might come up with an idea and the other and the artist says absolutely not that's awful i will never ever do that and you can't take it personally you just have to sort of brush that aside and kind of move on with it and go okay what about this idea you can't let it you can't let ego kind of play part in that because yeah a lot of the times i think especially working in majors you you know it's it's a thankless task at times um and you've just got to keep going you've just got to keep going and kind of like you know hustling hard for your artist there's a big uh, quote on the side from kirsty williams here having worked alongside andy for the past 16 years i can speak up and say he's always stayed true to himself his change has been an evolution very good quote i like that he hasn't changed from the 20 year old man I met at university. He leads our company from a place of collaboration. His major mindset influences and supports every single employee. Um, he supported me, we did it. Uh, his simple motto, hard work and be nice to people, really has served him well. Again, this is many of the points that we've been talking about here, actually played out here by a person that is employed by Andy, which is, you know, to me, that's really important. If you've got somebody inside your organization actually going, do you know what? Yeah, he's not just talking out there. It's 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 for real. I think it's a, it's a very, very important and, and big thing. Um, I do think really like for all, all executives, like as you as you kind of grow like in a in a business, whether you work for yourself or whether you're employed by somebody, I think that as you kind of grow and as you start to build a team underneath you, I think you have to like practice what you preach and you have to lead from the top because I think you, I think if you put yourself in, in a, say a a junior executive's position, sort of coming into a company, if they're sitting in a boardroom and their boss is kind of, isn't leading from the top, then how does that give them the sort of ambition and drive to kind of grow uh, both their own career and their artist career? So I, I do think that, yeah, sort of part of the major mindset really is kind of, yeah, leading leading from the top and leading by example. Yeah. Okay, here we go. So character traits, I'm coming to you, Shani. In, any examples, stories on your own career path, things that have changed your path, path sorry, through looking at life through a bigger lens? So any quotes of major mindset people, anything like that. So example stories on your own career path, things that have changed your path just by looking at things through that major mindset lens. Mm, um, I'm not sure. I don't, I'm not sure that I fully understand the question, but I I think that I, what I will say is, um, when I think about everything, um, I would venture to say that all of us here are are um, are are working in our like plan A, mm-hmm. in our plan A job. And 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 for me, when I look at 
friends of mine that are not in our in in their plan A job. I think the biggest characteristic of, is that we were all really courageous in that. And and I've always strived to when I'm signing, I also sign as a publisher, writers and producers as well as artists. But I always try to make sure that um, I sign people who encourage me to stay fearless because if I'm working with artists that are super, what's the word, uh, ambitious and and doing everything that they do to get to the next step and, and thinking huge, then it, it forces me to think that way too. And you wanna also hire people and be around people that think the same way. The biggest regrets I have were are, are are not always keeping myself around those kind of people in, in the past, is, if I understand the question correctly. Shanine, do you, I also think you're living proof to that, what he's actually asking, that like you've actually taken a job abroad and you've oh. gone to another country and a whole new setup and you've taken okay. a massive risk. You're entering a whole new bunch of people. So I, I think the biggest thing is actually what you've actually done in actually taking the role and actually okay. taking the plunge. And Listen, jumping that's across. exactly why I asked the question. I mean, I, thank you. you. You're telling me you got on a plane and went, I'm going to a whole new country. Right. Who plus you, my own aspiration, <laughs> my own dream. I, I always, I've always thought, I mean, every day that I wake up, I'm terrified. And I always think that if you're not terrified and you are comfortable, then you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. You should, I'm, I fiercely believe you always, <laughs> you should always be scared. You should always be outside of your comfort zone. I remember when my boss asked me to, to be the managing director in the UK, I actually thought, he was high and that maybe quarantine had gotten to him. I was like, guy, are you high? I am, the last time I was in London, I think I was dancing at a table at tape. I've seen what MDs in the UK look like. I I might've shown up to the next, the next day at a meeting hungover. Like, I don't think I'm managing director material. And, you know, I was so scared and so horrified by the idea of doing it was exactly the reason why I decided I had to do it. So if but, you're not terrified and the idea doesn't completely make you scared and want to run the other way, then it isn't big enough and you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be doing it. There's a big question here from Ree. It says, Shawnee, we all know the amount of black women in senior positions within music is still very low in comparison. As a black woman in music, what advice can you give me that helps you navigate through? Um, I, you know, it's funny. One of the things that I've been learning in this in the last two months is that I think I'm 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 nervous coming into the UK because I've been as bad as I think it is in the US. I've realized the privilege, sadly that there is in the US compared to the UK. And I'm sad that there's so much more work to do in the UK. Um, but one of the things I will say is I've been fortunate in the US that I've had so many people around me that, that held me accountable, that were also black, that came, that came ahead of me and that held the door open for me. And, and that, um, never made me feel like I couldn't do it because I was black. And prior to being in this business, I had parents that were really mindful and made sure that I was around constantly around examples that it, there was no excuse to not do it because I was black. And it was just about you know, work hard. And if that doesn't work, work harder. Being black, the privilege that I had was being black was never going to be an obstacle because it was never a choice. It was just like, it is who you are, so fucking do it. Like, and, and I think, you know, in a lot of ways, maybe that was my privilege and I'm still trying to figure out how I navigate that being here. One of the really hard things that I've had to learn in the last two months, and maybe, you know, I've been here quite a bit for the last five years, about a week a month, but, one of the things I've really noticed since October when I started this job was, wow, there's even less of us here than I had originally noticed. And that's going to be something I navigate. But, you know, I, I, maybe I will regret this, but I'm sure I won't. I always tell everyone, call me if there's anything that I can ever do. I'm always available. I definitely am passionate about knowing that I, if I'm the first, I won't, I won't be the last. 
and I always want to help and I always want to um, give anyone any opportunity that I've been given. Okay, people. So next question I'm coming to. Um, I've got to ask this. Quotes, right? If anybody knows any, this would be great. If you don't, it's fine. Any quotes of major mindset people that are dear to you and sometimes you draw on for inspiration? And for this one, Nemat, I'm going to go to, and I'm going to go yeah. and after that. If you have, um, it's okay, don't worry. No, I have a quote. I have a quote. So okay. Sylvia Roan is somebody who I've always looked up to kind of coming up. She was somebody I used to read about when I was at university and kind of, you know, when she was... Um, yeah, when she signed Missy, um, I, you know, she was the only black woman I saw in those spaces at the time, even when I didn't know what um, working at a record label meant. But she's always somebody that I've looked up to. Um, I'm not going to talk about the time I saw her in the Sony building and what I said, <laughs> but um, she, uh, she had a quote um, last year. She gave a speech at Berkeley. I think she was kind of getting an honorary doctorate. And she said, um, I'm not scared of losing because I know I can win. Yeah. And that quote for me, it kind of resonates with me, I think, because I've had a lot of ups and downs in this industry. I wouldn't say like my trajectory is being quite straightforward. So kind of to kind of that quote, I suppose, resonated with me because that was always my belief. Like even when I've had the low moments, there was never, ever a plan B. It was like music or nothing else. So anytime I've lost, didn't get a job that I wanted or didn't get to work with an artist that I was really a fan of. I kept going and I just didn't stop because I knew that when I got the chance, I would win and I would smash it. So um, that's a quote that I absolutely love. I mean, she says a bit more, but that's that's the bit that I love, but um, just to kind of expand a bit. So she says, you will make mistakes, you'll have successes and failures, but you have to be resilient and to look at your losses, put them in perspective, learn from them and then let them go. Um, and I just feel like that's definitely, it's like, it's like my bio, but it's probably really the title of my biography if I have the right one. So that's my quote. Brilliant. Andy Varley, you got, have you got a quote? Yeah. So um, many, many years ago, like when I, I mentioned DJ Fresh earlier on in this, uh, this panel um, and the second single that we put out as part of this commercial release cycle was with Rita Ora and Rita was uh, and still is managed by a really prolific music manager called Sarah Stennett, who I've got a lot of respect for. She's achieved some amazing stuff um but i think for those people that have worked with sarah in any way shape or form she is always working a million miles an hour and it's always like a fucking shit show in that place but for all the right reasons yeah. um and she uh, i remember being over there around the point that we were finishing this record it was super late at night and she had like i don't know she had like zayn malik on the phone or something dealing with some kind of shit storm with him and i was like how do you how do you cope like how do you channel all of this craziness and she yeah. turned to me i'm not going to try and do the liver puddle and act accent but she was like Andy out of chaos comes creativity and that has always really really stuck with me because she kind of talks to Shanice's point as well it's like there's always so much kind of craziness going on and you either channel it in a positive way or you let it kind of wear you down and I think sort of part of a major mindset is not being phased when uh, the shit's hitting the fan and and yeah to to take Sarah's point out of that chaos does come creativity. Rich Castillo, you got a quote? Yeah, mine was pretty bleak. Oh, it's all right. My one was um, success as many fathers and failure as an orphan. That's something that I, was, I was taught really early. <laughs> Everyone will claim it. And if you lose, then no one wants to claim it. And it's just how it goes sort of thing. So that's probably the one I just hit you straight with. I would say this to you. Is that a characteristic sometimes of major mindset people? As in, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fair enough. If it's the truth, that's the truth. That was an easy one. Okay. That was easy. Okay, fine. Let's move it along. Okay, so onwards. Austin Darbo. And then I'm coming to Shani. So, quote. Well, first of all, everyone tries to claim the independent successes too. So let's not make it out like it's just a major thing. Um, <laughs> Uh, what's the most, I think probably two, uh, the first one was persistence beats resistance. So when I was first Ooh. trying to get into the industry, 
um, it was like someone t- said to me, you've got to learn the art of, you know, subtly hustling and subtly bugging people. So, you know, how do you consistently email someone or try to get a response out of someone without bugging them or coming across as annoying or stalkery? Um, so that's something that I've, I've sort of learned and has always stuck with me. Um, and the second one was at a crossroads in my career, my former boss, Laura Lucans, who funnily enough works with Sarah Stennett, she's the lady who put me on in this industry. She said to me, perception versus reality, choose one. Um, when I came to a crossroads in my career where um, I could have taken a job that from a perception point of view um, might have been seen as maybe a sideward step or maybe even a step downwards. But um, I suppose maybe let's say financially and life-wise, it, it, it would have, you know, been, been, it would have changed things for me. Um, and yeah, that's always stuck with me. So whenever I make these big decisions, I always think to myself, perception, reality, you know, which one am I going to go for? So yeah, man, they're the two quotes for me. Wow. Big quotes, I have to say. And to Shani. You know, I worked for L.A. Reid for a long time and he is nuts. But, you know, it's like the best, it's the best training I think you can have as an A&R person. One of the things he used to always tell us was don't come back with the no. And like he meant that literally, like don't come back with the no. So I think, you know, for me, it's always in my brain. Like you just, it's this, the most aggressive, passive aggressive, almost stalkery kind of, you know, don't come back with the no. And it's always been the thing that stuck with me. And um, it, 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 for me, it's, it's still, I don't, I, I just can't take a no. If I, I need you to, I need to know that you're actually trying. I need to know that you've tried. I need to know that you've done something. I can't take a no. The other thing LA used to tell us was, and I'm going to try not to say it with all the extra words, but I, I can't. It was, I don't give a fuck what your title is. You're all assistants. And I think that the, way, the way that that, he didn't care if you were, he didn't care what your title was. He didn't care who you, if you were the president, he used to say, you're the president of whatever the fuck, you're the executive vice president of some shit. You're all assistants. And I think that his perspective on that, and that always stuck with me because even to this day, if I'm in the studio and an artist needs something, I'm not waiting for somebody to get it for me. I'm not looking for somebody's assistant to go get a coffee or water or anything. I am going to get whatever I need for whoever. We are all assistants to these artists. They're the people that bring in the money. I hate to reduce it down to that, but we are all here for them. So I don't have time to wait for other people. I'm always trying, if I can do it myself, I will. And those are the two things that's always, I'm not waiting for no, and I'm always still an assistant. Whoa, people, Innis, quote time. Um, I've, I've got a couple, well, a couple of sort of mantras and, and it, the first one is never accept no as an answer. Okay. Um, segue beautifully. <laughs> um, second one, never act out promotion. Oh, hold on. Never act out promotion. Of emotion. Oh, never act out of emotion. Okay, I've got you. Yeah. Feel yourself. And the third one is a bit of a lull, but it is a genuine quote that I used to quote in my 20s, and it's by Eminem. And it was, success is my only motherfucking option, failure is not. <laughs> you people are on fire today indeed and with that i might well just light okay so here we go 2020 let's move swiftly on to what changed for your business was it major who wants to go first i don't mind going first go ahead I mean, it was fucking major, wasn't it? And it continues to be. Um, I think as like an independent operator, um, first and foremost, I, I employ 55 people between London and LA. And the first thing that kind of really dawned on me was the fact that I was responsible for trying to keep these 55 people in jobs. And at that point, none of us really knew kind of what was going to happen over the coming months. Um, and I think one of the things that we did is like, I, I kind of 
mentally told myself, and this was something that was shared between our kind of board of directors and senior management team, was that we were going to do everything in our power to make sure that nobody got made redundant and nobody had to take a pay cut. And I feel really proud of the fact that we've got sort of eight months through this whole pandemic and have been able to kind of achieve that. So I'm really chuffed with that. But what I would say is that we we had to forecast, reforecast, strategize, re-strategize. You have to remember that when you're getting into a job in the entertainment industry, you're not just coming in to do a nine to five. It's 24 hours a day. It's seven days a week. Yeah. Like my, my wife will hate me for saying this, but like my, my clients are the people that I think about first when I wake up in the morning Ooh. and they're the people that I think about before I go to bed at night. And that, I guess Mrs. Barley, we apologize. We didn't mean that to come out like that. It's not, you know, don't take it out on us. Sorry, carry it's on. true. It's true for what Shani said. Like we, without our talent, without our clients, without the artists, like none of us would be in jobs, you know? So it is something I'd, I'd sort of take very seriously. So I think part of the sort of change for me I mean, it's kind of a, a slight kind of uh, movement on from your question Kwame but it's I think what has changed for the business is also the fact that we are so responsible for all of our clients that we've also hacked, had to really kind of dig in and uh, help our clients with their mental health you know it's like that has been a, a, a top of our agenda throughout all of this it's being mindful of like the team's mental health and our talent's mental health and and I think none of us are necessarily qualified. Well, I'm certainly not qualified uh, in sort of mental health discussions, but it's been something that as, as we've had to learn and we've had to um, sort of pivot into around all of this. So, so yeah, I think a combination of things have changed. Uh, I guess the, the planning and forecasting financially, trying to protect jobs, um, trying to deal with mental health issues on a daily basis, including like, my own mental health you know it's like i think it's it's something that people often think that when you get to a certain level within a company that you become immune to all of the really really tricky mental health conversations like yourself and i think at the same time as trying to sort of keep your team uh team's mental health in check you you also really have to be mindful of your own as well so sorry i went off on a bit of a tangent there but that's kind of my answer Listen, we're, we're all good with that. We've got questions yeah, properly coming in at the moment. So I'm trying to just... <laughs> I just wanted to quickly add as well, I think the other major change that we've experienced this year, it's just, is how we actually work and sort of the whole idea of having to be in an office and working at nine to five um, has completely kind of changed. And I think what this pandemic's done is kind of proved that we can work from anywhere. The idea of having to be all in the same building at the same time, as great as it is for collaborating, you know, it, it's not essential anymore. And hopefully out of this comes a new normal where flexible working hours is a real thing that people can sort of tap into. And, you know, you have a bit more of a kind of a, a relaxed way of kind of where you work. You don't have to commute every day um, to work in an office if you don't need to. Um, and I think so with the mental health sort of um, issues, I think Sony's definitely, as a company, we've been working really hard on that. And I think with the Black Lives Matter movement that's happened this year as well, that sort of obviously impacted a lot of people's mental health. And there was sort of a big drive to make sure that people are taken care of and people are, have resources that they can tap into and people they can talk to. I think, I think this year, as horrible as it's been, I think it's been a blessing in many ways because the way we work and the way we see staff um, has changed a lot and the way we take care of staff has had to change. Um, and hopefully that's just something that we can carry on forward um, and not just leave this year. Wow. Okay. 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 This is good. This is good. Um, okay, Katarina, what resources are in place at a major level to help artists with their mindset? Who defines that? How well trained are they in understanding human behavior, mind mechanics? So some, this is basically somebody asking, hold on, where do you get, where do you get that info, the major mindset info? Like as in, you know, it's, 
it's, as we're saying, some people are saying, it's not really something that's written down in books. Other people are saying, you know, nature nurtured. You know, is there not a school? Is there a, what's the best school? There you go. Who wants to take that on? Experience is the best teacher. Okay. Um, and failure is the best teacher, you know. Um, everything that I've learned has just come from from doing. And sometimes that doing has been very bad. Like it's, I've, de I've delivered, you know, a lot of bad things over the years. Things have gone wrong. There's been times I've been embarrassed. There's been times when people have said no to me. There's been a lot of rejection. And it's interesting because um, as, you, as you grow in your career, the no's don't stop. In fact, the no's probably become more and they become more yeah. problematic. So exactly, it become more problematic. So whereas if I heard no, maybe let's say 10 years ago, that might have just been no to somebody coming on a radio show. Whereas, mm. you know, now if somebody says no, that could be a no that costs a million pounds revenue. Or that could be a no that maybe even some put, put someone out of a job, for example. So um, I would say that like, experience, man, is the best teacher, everything. And I'm still learning now to this day. I'm 15 years into my career. And I still feel like I'm blagging it. I still feel like the teenager that managed to, you know, blag his way into the game all them years ago. And I, I'm still learning, man. I don't think anyone's got the answers. So that's what I'd say when it comes to that. Yeah. I think it's also understanding that you don't know everything and you're never going to know everything. So there's always something new for you to learn. Um, and not being ashamed of that because it's just, there's no point of kind of wanting to be the smartest person in the room. I'd rather be in a room with the other smart people and learn from them. Okay, I got some, I, we're gonna go quick fire on the questions now. Um, Shaz Martinez, hey guys, respect each and every one of you. Speaking on creative cultural advancement, can we speak about, in the UK, about the UK Latin scene and why it hasn't been tapped into considering the global reach of Latin music that La Latin music has had in the last few years. I'm managing a, the best UK Latin artist right now and would appreciate any advice to propel this movement. Gracias from Shaz Martinez. I guess I, I don't mind jumping in there. I think part of the issue that we have in the UK is that we obviously have like a very sort of few number of gatekeepers at UK radio. And ultimately, if there's a, a particular sound that UK radio programmers don't see as working, then it can sometimes mean that you hit a bit of a glass ceiling. But from a Sony perspective, there's a guy in Sony called Dusko, who is like the guy so far as Latin music. And whilst he's based out of the UK, he it's his job really in making sure that Latin music is on the agenda for all global uh, uh, music consumption market. So slip in, slip a... Uh, uh, I was going to say CD then, slip a, a link to some music uh, to, to Dusko. I'm showing my age, unfortunately. Um, slip, slip a link to some music to Dusko. I'm not going to give you his email address because he'll probably uh, not thank me if there's like 300 odd um, links coming in. But if you search his name, Dusko Justic, uh, J-U-S-T-I-C, uh, he's a really great guy um, and incredibly knowledgeable. Wow. Okay. We're going to keep these coming. Okay, so this one I'm going to go for, who hasn't had a question recently? Rich hasn't probably, and I think Namat but, and Shani. So most position, so Justine Perrett, most position I see available in majors require a degree in business slash accounting slash marketing, etc. Is there a way to get into the business with a degree in songwriting or no degree needed at all? Is it mostly through internships? Through uni, I've developed as much interest for the business as I've got for the artist side, as a general. And again, we're, we're motoring through these. So. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a broad question. I think yeah. the truth is there's no one route in. I think every single person on this panel will have a different story about how they got in. Some would have went to university, some wouldn't. I think it's about sort of um, doing your research, finding finding out who the key people are that could sort of help you sort of have an entry point. I think all the major labels have internships within within the companies. I think 
um, they all do, so you can apply through that. Um, but I think generally, I always think with any job that you sort of really want to get into, you kind of got to start just doing it as in the job and then sort of reach out to the people that are doing it too and try and show, demonstrate that you're able to sort of um, do do that area in some capacity well. So um, I think the internships is probably the best first border call for anything to do with a major. David you know O'Sullivan. People. Very good answer. David O'Sullivan says, for Shani, what was it like to see Travis Scott's journey to his stardom as it seems really unique to me, as it seems to, it seems from an outside point of view that his crazy live performances that helped him get to that next level, e.g. going from birds in a trap around 70k first week to Astro Worlds, Astro World, sorry, over half a million. Go for it, Shani. Um, he started, I mean, obviously, you know, he started well before Birds in a Trap, but what's really funny, you bring up the live performance. The first thing I remember, I had, I called LA, he was on vacation and I called LA on vacation and I asked him to come back a day early. I think he might've threatened to fire me if it wasn't that good. And he came in and, and LA used to have this thing where you'd Can have- Can we talk about LA for a minute? <laughs> like, everything seems to come with a, with a hammer attached. <laughs> like uh, I mean, listen, LA was demanding and he is, when I worked for him and I don't know anybody who didn't, he is, he's LA Reed. He was always this very formidable figure, um, larger than life. He's meant a lot in, in the US. He was just a, a really, really respected and deserved as much with all the things that he had accomplished in, in his career. So, you know, at that point he'd also been on X Factor. So he was a celebrity as well, but, he was doing at that. He had been on TV. He had, and and I think the season might have just wrapped and had needed a well-deserved break. And here I am, some ridiculous, rude A and R person. Which I think, as an A and R person, you have to have that quality of turning an every no into into your yes. And I'm sure the A and R people on here can attest to that. You just can't accept a no. But um, I asked him to come back and, and LA had this thing where you had to perform for him. And I think it was less about the performance, but just being able to be ready in, to do anything and to just have the confidence to perform for one person in an office, as well as for you know a, an arena. And he wanted Travis to perform and Travis didn't like miss a beat. He jumped on LA's desk and, and performed as if he were in Madison Square Garden and, or I'm sorry, the O2, I'm trying to keep it English here. Oh, there we go. And um, he, he like jumped on LA's desk and he like rubbed his head. And I remember sitting in the office like, oh my God, what is happening? And he, I mean, he performed like there was a band and 20,000 people watching. And it was, it was insane. I, I almost jumped up and started singing along. <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah. And again, he, was, he, had a, he was a kid that maybe had a thousand followers. So I, I don't know, from then you just knew that he had it. He had it and we all believed in it that early. I think what happened was um, after after it got signed and it took a month, it took a month of don't accept no for an answer. LA was looking at me like, don't come back in this office until it, this deal is signed. And it took a long time. Wow. Um, I feel like a camp counselor at some point because the group of friends was getting bigger. I was like, it, it, was, a, it was a lot. But uh, from that point, um, Kanye was around from early days. He, he was very he was very slow and very intentional in what he wanted to do and creating his art. I remember Travis came to me early and told me he wanted to make a video. I went and begged for this money and he came back after he spent like 10 grand, brand new artist, and it was like naked women in a bathtub of milk. And I remember LA saying to me like, let me see the video and I was like, so it's art, it's art, it's art. But it was really just like naked women in a bathtub of milk. I still have this video somewhere, but I think his journey is both unique and similar to any other artist of that caliber. It, 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 it's unique in the sense that he took his own steps, but it's similar in the sense that he stayed on his path and he, um, he, he stayed the course. 
and he kept doing the things. He had like peripheral vision to get yeah. to where he needed to get to. And he didn't take no for an answer. And he just was like, fuck it, I'm going. And I don't care what anybody tells me, I'm doing this. Someone said the other day, these people it often, they're like, my train, this is the train, it's going. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna jump on, fine, but it's going anyway. Is yeah. that okay? Basically, listen, we had to, we, I remember I used to have to call him and be like, you gotta leave the studio just to go, even to just go shower and come back. Like we used to have to pull him out of the studio and not pull him so out. Long that he was in the studio for? I, I don't, I don't, he would be in there for days, like days at a time. Yeah. And I would have to, it wouldn't be because it'd be girls and friends and yeah. no, he would be in there just working all the time, Grossing. talking to me. And I would, I love being in the studio, but I would give up and be like, I gotta go sleep. I'm like, I need to sleep. And I'd get calls five in the morning, six in the morning, like just, you know, you gotta come back. I have one for you. So, yeah. Nema and Austin, how did you cope with 2020? So you've answered it a bit. I'm gonna start with Austin, go. Um, how did I cope? Um, yeah, I cope by 2020. Yeah, kind of you know what i cope by just um just trying to be chill about things right everyone this is this is the one question and the one topic that every single person that's listening on this panel can relate to right yeah. um and and we've all had different ways of doing it i mean my mine was a bit weird because i obviously left left the company during the pandemic and and have joined one um so it was definitely a bit strange for me um and the way that i've really coped with it is just by throwing myself in head first um, I joined Atlantic, I joined Warner about two weeks after um, the George Floyd killing and the, the, the you know, the, the craziness um, that ensued after that, um, which was great, may I add. Um, so it, it was quite easy for me to be distracted. <laughs> um, I definitely wasn't at home twiddling my thumbs. Mm. So, yeah, man, I, I've just tried to, you know, make sure that I just carry on doing what I'm doing, try to keep keep everything as normal as possible, where possible. I've always been quite lucky in that I've always worked in companies that have been relatively flexible when it comes to flexible working arrangements. Um, so there's not been a huge, massive kind of change there for me. Uh, and yeah, man, just, you know, throwing myself head first into trying to find, you know, and working with Rich and his team in finding, you know, the best new artists to sign, develop and, and put to market. So, you know, that's the slightly corporate answer for me in terms of <laughs> how my 2020 has been. Ines and Nemat. How did you cope with 2020? Do you want to go first, Anis? <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, I walked my dog an awful lot. Yeah. Right. And I got a lot from my animal. Yeah. Um, I focused we on trying some to rabbits. eat. We got Pardon? some rabbits. We got some okay. rabbits. Yeah. My daughter, my daughter got, my daughter got two rabbits. Are they house rabbits? Yeah, well, no, actually, we've got a garden, but we, we make sure because there's some foxes around here that look at them and they're like, you're my lunch. But yeah, but, um, but yeah, yeah the, that, the dog was amazing. Um, I tried to focus on eating healthily and um, helping my sort of elderly high risk parents. I kind of felt mm. um, rewarded by doing something for other people because we are all in a service industry, industry, mm. sorry. So I'm used to doing things to help people. And when that was taken away, all of a sudden had a bit of a panic. Um, so I did that. And then I did a lot of sort of time management for myself. So yeah. like scheduling. So make, make sure you get up by a certain time, still do some exercise, eat good food, walk the dog, go see the parents. And that's how I kind of managed it. Well, <laughs> no matter. Listen. Um, yeah. Austin. In it. Great answers. Shani, over to the mat. Let's go. Bam. I mean, quickly for me is it was about kind of practicing gratitude a lot more. I think the first lockdown was really difficult and I think I complained a lot, but I kind of came to realize that I'm actually, you know, and I think I could, I think we can all say in this Zoom that we're all quite lucky when you sort of reading about, you know, people, people passing away from COVID, people losing their jobs. 
all of that, I think it kind of just gave me the perspective I needed. So I was like practicing gratitude. Actually, I still have my job. Luckily, great. Um, thank God. I have a roof over my head. Um, you know, I, you know, I did lose people to COVID, which was unfortunate, but you know, my family is healthy and really well. And, you know, it's like focusing on that, focusing on the, on the things that you do have instead of sort of the rest of it. I'm a homebody anyways. So like telling me to stay at home is I'm never ever going to complain about that yeah. <laughs> at all. <And? laughs> um, obviously it'd be nice to see people now, but it is that it's just like, I think recognizing kind of like the, the, the blessings in the middle of all the chaos, I think was really is what's kind of kept me going. And as well, um, I think like, I said, just with work, the, the big thing that I've got from this year is like I've got a real focus and a real drive to make sure that people's mental health in the music industry is taken care of. That's artists and people that work in the business. So it, that's been a big focus for me. And I know it's a big focus at Sony. So it, I just want to make sure, yeah, that going forward that people are okay and that they've got the resources they need to make sure that, you know, they can get help when they need it. Because I think this year's just showed that life can affect everybody you know it doesn't matter how strong you think you are so but for me it is that it's just about recognizing the blessings you know i'm well i have a job i have food in my fridge so that's the most important thing and my family are all healthy and well if i i one sentence i heard so much in 2020 people just said this year's a lot yeah a lot it's a lot, a lot. it's a lot mm -hmm. um, Rich Castillo, how do you handle executive stress? What did you do to chill out? Chill out. Um, for me, um, the executive stress. I, I'm like I'm one of those people where, when it's I sort of I tend to thrive when when it's kicking off. I tend to thrive when when things are going a bit left and a bit. I always sort of I'm always just well up for it sort of thing. So for me, I've tried to focus on all the good side of it and the opportunity side of it and sort of where I can sort of really. Um, up my productivity. Um, in terms of my relaxation, personally, I've got an amazing family at home. I've got a lovely wife and kids, and I sort of I'm able to see them a lot more. I'm, I'm doing the school runs with them, which I find really sort of helpful just to start my day off and clear my head. Um, also, before the most recent lockdown, there's a lot of us in the, in the industry that I started playing tennis. So I've taken up a new sport just to sort of find some a bit of escapism, and I've just been focusing on that. But generally, I think within the whole lockdown and the whole of 2020, there's been so much madness, but I thought there's been so many pockets of opportunities and pockets of ways to get ahead of stuff and pockets of way to be more productive and way to sort of um, really get ahead of, of the pack that I've just tried to take every single possible chance to sort of help us win a bit more um, at every, every opportunity I've had. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Um, I have one. Again, and this is for Andy and Shani. What do you do to chill out? Do you want yeah. to start, Sh Shani? Shani. Should I start? And don't say that LA, LA told you unless you chill. <laughs> no, no. I'm just going to say I'm American. I think that English people have conquered with the work-life balance. I'm going to use the excuse of being American. We haven't conquered that. I think like rich somehow in this really unhealthy way, I kind of strive, like, I'm sorry, thrive in, in stress to some degree. Um, it's hard because you, I've spent a lot of this year calming down our create, like our writers, your producers, your artists. Um, I don't know, and I'm not working, which feels like all the time. I guess I'm sleeping. And if I'm not sleeping, I'm working, sadly. Yeah, yeah. I, okay. I, I think for me as well, like I, I always uh, before all of this, I always really struggled with the whole like work life balance thing. Uh, I live down in Brighton and commute into London during normal times would commute into London every day. And that's kind of a lot of time sat on a train. And uh, my wife and I had a son last year and he turned six months, literally the day we went into lockdown. I remember my wife being absolutely furious. She's like, you've gate crashed my fucking maternity leave. How dare you? <laughs> uh, but actually, like, in a way, it's um, that's kind of been a welcomed distraction, having a six-month-old who really doesn't give a damn, like, if your forecasting isn't going according to plan or if your release strategy is being pushed back because it's hard to 
push for a development artist when there's a lack of promo opportunities. So it brings got it back a nappy, down to basics. The nappy needs to be changed now. Exactly. But exactly. End. I mean, to be honest, I went from dealing with a lot of shit in the office to a lot of shit at home. So hey! it's, kind of, it's not really been too much of a change. But um, but no, kind of jokes aside, like, like same as Innes. Um, I think for those people that happen to follow me on Instagram, probably get sick and tired of my endless dog photos and pictures of sunsets on Brighton Beach. But um, but gen like genuinely, kind of getting out and getting fresh air um, is just really great at kind of. Uh, giving you really sort of pure mental clarity so I really just enjoy sort of getting getting out and sort of taking that all in but just taking this question on give us some of the things that you know as we say 2020s lessons look for me I'm a little bit on the astrological tip and to me it's like you know when you actually checked what was going on with the stars and stuff around this time and then you put it into place. There were so many star shapes that like hadn't happened for like hundreds of years and all of this kind of stuff. A lot of planets were in retrograde this year. Yeah. All this stuff was going on. And you know, <laughs> listen, I remember there's an artist that Ellen Edris who said to me about, he was, used to talk to me about this, this uh, a lot. And, and I have to sit there and agree sometimes because I'm like, you know, you'd phone up your mate and your mate would be like, are you feeling like that? And I go, yeah, I go, are you feeling like that? They go, yeah. Yeah, you're feeling that. Or have you just had a whole morning of arguments? So you go, yeah, and that would happen. So I'm just, any lessons from 2020 from the panel? Because look, for me, people know I got COVID. I'm lucky to be here. So you know what? I just, I'm, I t I'm like, whichever way. I, every day when I wake up, when people phone me up, they know. First, Kwame, how are you? I'm like, alive and well what's next yeah so that's the situation and then from that going into blm and you know i had days where i was literally i'd start i'd be in a meeting i'd just start crying i'd just start crying you know yeah. that was i'm just just saying you know so any lessons from 2020 i 2020 taught me a lot i wasn't on zoom before 2020 and now I'm, I'm Mr. Zoom, Kwame Zoom Kwatten, you know. So this is what I want to know. Austin, any lessons from 2020? Let's start with you, sir. Um, don't be afraid to speak up if you see something that doesn't quite feel right. You know, we've obviously seen that a lot, especially, you know, in, in big companies. Um, and yeah, just look after you and yours. You know, obviously we've all hopefully spent more time around our families or at least speaking to them or checking up on them. Um, so that's, that'll be my last words, man. Just look after you and your stay healthy. Um, your own health is more important than anything. Number one records, platinum albums, you know, all of that pales into insignificance when it comes to the health of you and yours, man. So, um, yeah, they're the two things I'd say. Lessons from 2020. Ines. I'll mirror what Austin said. It's just, that, um, nothing's more important than those that are, are close to you and that you love. Uh, look after them and be kind. We need to be a bit kinder to humans and to the planet, actually. Come on, come on, <laughs> come on, come on. It's like, honestly, we've seen some stuff. This, and I don't even want to go into the American election because that's like, that huh. would just, my head will explode, right? You know, man still hasn't accepted that he's lost. So I didn't even understand that. So don't even get me started there. I'll just go back to Rich. Go ahead. Um, for me, um, lessons have just been sort of what push through. My lessons have just been like, just keep going, keep pushing through. Um, I agree with everything else everyone else said about sort of take, taking care of your loved ones. I think the family thing for me has been the, my, my biggest sort of rock that pushed me through the year properly. But I think my biggest thing is just keep pushing through and stay focused. Keep pushing through, stay focused. Okay. Um, let's go to Andy. Uh, just expect the unexpected, really. I think <laughs> this is, this is the, the year where all of the plans that anybody Ooh. had written at the start of this year, it's all been kind of torn up and you kind of go back to back to basics again. So, so yeah, it might sound like an obvious thing to say, but... 
Well, I, I really don't. I don't think anything's obvious in 2020. Shani's 2020 lesson. I think the first thing was always remembering to stay flexible was one. And then some friends and I were talking about this yesterday and we were all like friends in music. And we were all saying that this was our lesson. And again, this is a big thing in America is remembering to keep a, a work life, a balance that a lot of us here don't remember to, to have. Remembering to check up on, on each other, on our, remembering oh, on to, each other. Yeah, check, check up on each other, which is interesting. We, we work so hard together and we sometimes remember to say, yo, how are you? Are you good? Are, do you need anything? And sometimes we spend more time with each other than we spend with our actual, with our families. So just checking up on each other and also remembering to stop and to, to go see friends and family as well, so. Incredible, incredible. And who else have I, Nimat? Um, my a personal one is, is family first. Um, that's sort of like my biggest lesson. And that's the family you're born into or the family that you choose. So that's friends, you know, colleagues. Um, it's, they're the most important thing. Um, uh, from a work perspective, I think it's just always be ready, always be prepared for, you know, like Andy said, unexpected, the unexpected. Um, and then I'm gonna steal one lesson um, from my friend, my wonderful, wonderful sister, um, Taponiswa. Um, before I just say that, <laughs> um, my nephew is watching, he's really young, so I'm gonna ask my sister to cover his ears, but basically, don't be a dick. Just don't be a dick this year. <laughs> just be nice to people. <laughs> That's, that's, that one's from Tappy. I stole that one from Tappy. But, yeah. I cannot think of a better way. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot. I cannot think of a better way to end. Listen, people, if you're going to tweet anything, that last phrase there, just tweet it. Ultimate Seminar 2020. Taponiswa. Don't be a dick. <laughs> Come on, man. Come on, come on. She's going to kill me, but I don't care. <laughs> well, I was, listen, folks, I will say thank you so much to the great Austin Darbo, the great Rich Castillo, the incredibly great Ines Ferguson, the greater Nemat Abdella, yeah. the great Shawnee Gonzalez, the great Andy Vali. And I, I don't even know I, how or what. People, I can see people are here. Big up everyone on this panel. Oh, C keeps saying, I need Shani. I need oh, Shani. I love your Shani, I'm going to call you, Shani. Just saying. <laughs> just going, I need Shani. I need Shani. I'm, session. This is from I'm in London full time in January. I'll need friends. Yeah. Oh, fucking brilliant! She's written Christy Williams. Also, awesome. She says thanks for being such wonderful. There we go. It's flying now. Shani, a friend is here. This is from Jay Alexander. <laughs> Be where? <laughs> okay, at D'Angelo. Big up. We've got Shani back. We've got. Thank you for every single one of you. Uh, that's from Natalie Wheel. We've got. Uh, Andy Vala, Andy Vala, oh, thank you. She, he's right there. Okay, yeah, very good. That's good. Okay, incredible panels. Wow. Uh, grateful for this webinar. Can't wait to be back tomorrow. And that's the perfect segue. So, Gems, as per usual, Ultimate Seminar 2020. You know, Nikki Charles said to us, she said, we were sitting there, we're going, how are we going to do it this year? Because people can't come. She just looked at us with her tech head on and went, virtual, isn't it? <laughs> just Nicola like, Ossai. Nicola oh, Charles, F F Charles, formerly Charles Osai, married to TJ, said, virtual, isn't it? Just like that. And we all, our heads just went like this. And uh, yeah, we fretted, but we're here, you know, and people, what a wonderful panel. What a wonderful panel. I've been here, I've got my joysticks, I've got my horn, I've got my that was easy when it was easy. I've got my bell. You've all been wonderful, seriously. 
Austin again, Ennis again, Rich again, Shani again, Andy again, Nema again. Thank you. Namaste, everything brilliant. And I can't, the talent here, executive wise, is too much. I, I, I'm going to need to fan myself and sleep later on. Mm -hmm.